Good morning, everyone. Dr. David Wild, Vice President of Performance Improvement here at the University of Kansas Health System, sitting in for Dr. Steve Stites this morning. We're coming to you live from the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. With us in studio today is the one and only Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. And joining us via Skype today are KDHE Secretary and my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Lee Norman, as well as the KDHE Bureau of Disease and Prevention Director, Phil Griffin. Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna answer questions about the virus spread and update plans for distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine. But first, Dana, let's hear how we did overnight. Yeah, I mean, we're still okay, but could have been better. Uh, we were worried uh, it was gonna be more acute infections, and I think there still are projections for that, obviously. Uh, but today in the hospital, we have 84 um, active or acute infections, with 31 of those in the ICU and 12 of those on the ventilator. Unfortunately, we still have 42 who are in that recovery period, and uh, only two on the ventilator, so that's a good thing as well. Hayes has been pretty busy, though, also. They have 27 active infections and three in that recovery phase as well. So. Um, both here and in Hayes, we have a lot of acute infections taking up a lot of beds and capacity for that reason. Yeah. No doubt, and um, uh, the person who was on transfer center call all night uh, last night, mm -hmm. the uh, repeated calls overnight from hospitals across the state um, and really the region, uh, several from Missouri as well, uh, just with no ability to take one more patient in their place with patients overflowing, COVID positive patients overflowing from their emergency departments was, was a little bit sobering again overnight. Um, let's maybe start by jumping right in with you, Dr. Norman. Um, you've heard our numbers here and in Hayes, and uh, I know you're in touch with a number of people across the state. Um, what, what do you know about the virus spread this morning and what do you think um, is really fueling these new numbers? Well, we're certainly seeing it statewide, David. Uh, and the change has been over these last few weeks, it's been yes in uh, nursing homes and prisons to a degree, um, but it's a lot of household contacts and gatherings. And it used to be more in the aforementioned prisons and, and nursing homes, but now it's just community-wide in every community. And that's what's really driving these numbers. You know, the, you're right, the, the cluster information gets a lot of attention, especially when long-term care facilities are involved. But, um, but I think we would say the same. We know that the majority of our patients that are hitting the hospital, for example, are, are community spread. They're not from, from those places. Um, you know, we, we had the opportunity yesterday to talk with Dr. Minns uh, from Wichita uh, pretty extensively about what's happening there. Um, and one of the questions um, uh, that was brought up was his sort of commentary on conversations across the Wichita area about the potential to need tent hospitals or National Guard support for providing care. Um, from your perspective, uh, are we near those things? And if not, what point do we start talking about them at the statewide level? Well, the problem with the tents is that we don't have anybody to staff them. I've been working since March with hospital leaders and executives, and this is a disaster, obviously, uh, across the country. And it's not like a tornado or a flood where you can go to other states and pull people in. Every, every state has this problem. So we could put up fixed wall facilities or tents and we would not have anybody to staff them. Uh, we are trying our best to do contracts uh, throughout the country to bring people in, but everybody's competing for those. I think our salvation is something slightly different. Um, and Dana, Dr. Hawkinson talked about it, and that is we have a lot of beds in Kansas, but they're in the wrong place and they're not critical care beds. So what I think we are, and what we're working on very diligently is returning or repatriating the recovery patients that Dr. Hawkinson mentioned so as to uh, open up beds in the tertiary and quaternary care facilities. And I think that's, I have some degree of optimism that we can do that and return patients once they've come through their most acute phase back to the hospitals that can take care of them, the medium and smaller size hospitals throughout the state. So we're, we have a lot of strategies we're working on to free up beds in the places that need them most. Mm -hmm. 
You know, uh, you mentioned that uh, one of our challenges, probably our bigger challenge, is actually staffing. And we have no doubt felt that across the metropolitan area. We know from our partners across the state that, that health care workers um, uh, and staffing of health care facilities has been a challenge. One of the other things we've heard a lot about the past few weeks has been um, reserve medical corps men from state reserve units being brought in uh, to provide patient care. Uh, do we have that option in Kansas? Yes, we do have a state medical uh, reserve medical corps. Matter of fact, I'm even on that reserve medical corps. Um, and uh, that is still remains a possibility. There are some issues that are not trivial about licensing and emergency declarations and the like, but we've got that uh, uh, plan, it's on the shelf, uh, but could be activated. It won't provide probably the right mix of people for what we need. Um, but uh, that is definitely uh, within the realm of possibility. It's good to know that that resource uh, exists. I know uh, we've talked about your responsibilities as part of that Reserve Medical Corps before. Um, and uh, we had Dr. Alley here, who I know works with you um, uh, pretty extensively on things like this. So it's good to really provide that picture, I think, for the rest of the community. Um, as we talk about what we see happening across the state. You mentioned smaller and medium-sized hospitals in smaller communities really across the state. We know that there um, is growth of cases and growth of hospitalizations in those areas as well. Um, what, what do we need to do specifically to help those smaller communities from your perspective? Well, number one, they need to help themselves. Um, they have been, I think, uh, very slow to come aboard with the anti-contagion measures that we know work. And we're not necessarily talking about shutting schools down or closing businesses. Um, I see the Dodge City uh, in Ford County, uh, I think last night passed a mask mandate, for example. And that's the first that they've had of anything like that in Dodge City. It's not surprising that the numbers are quite high there. And I give Dr. Trotter, who is uh, my county counterpart there, credit for helping usher that through. The county's still holding out and not doing the any kinds of mass gathering limitations and the like. And I think counties need to pick it up a little bit, quite honestly. One other thing we're doing, uh, Dr. Weil, that I think you'll find and the people will find fascinating is that we are in um, bringing in what we're calling a kind of an air traffic control because I feel bad when these like uh, small towns like in Colby or Norton or something have a patient that needs to transfer, and you made mention of it from the transfer center, calling hospital, 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 uh, and take six, eight, 10 hours to find a, a bed. We're bringing in a service that we think will be fully functional within the next couple of weeks. It's already working in many communities now where the hospitals will make one phone call, hand off of the necessary information for them to affect the transfer so that those nurses, for example, can go back to taking care of patients. They'll match the patient needs with the facility and bed that can provide that. So it's not this sequential dialing, 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 and takes essentially caregivers out of out of commission uh, affecting that transfer. Then that service will also arrange the either ground or air transportation. So we're trying to, what I would call load level across the state uh, and make it easy to refer, but also the quid pro quo will be repatriation of patients going back to the communities uh, or perhaps nursing facilities. So we need to unencumber the beds in the tertiary care facilities. Yeah, the uh, experience that our care collaborative has had with a, a version, I think, of what you're talking about has been positive. And, and I think we have heard over and over and over again from uh, nurses or nurse practitioners or physicians calling from small hospitals who are the ones who have to make those calls mm -hmm. around transfer, that they have spent five or six hours trying to arrange transfer for a single patient and it's prevented them or taken them away from providing care for others. So it is a very, very important problem. Um, and. Uh, yeah. I'm sure you know anything that we can do as the University of Kansas Health System to aid in that effort, um, please, please do let us know. Uh, a common question uh, that we hear uh, both from the community and I think from those that we personally have contact with is, what are you recommending right now um, for families as we approach the holidays? Thanksgiving, I guess, in particular, as it comes up next week. Well. That's a tough one and it's an emotional one. Uh, I recommend that people keep it small um, and I think they can get together, but I would have no more than a handful of uh, maybe four people getting together and stay so socially distanced. The goal for a Thanksgiving uh, is to get together 
but to stay distance enough uh, to not be considered a close contact. So I think you can get together safely. I, I, but I think it's a great time to take a pause. If we screw up during Thanksgiving and have a huge surge of cases, December is going to be bleak. So I would recommend that people virtually carve the turkey with those they love. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, we have seen, without a doubt, um, an increase in hospitalization seven to 10 days after Halloween. And in my neighborhood, I know that there were families that don't live together that were trick-or-treating together. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the fact that their children go to school together um, gives a, a, some degree of, of safety or feeling of safety. Um, but, but even yesterday, a good friend said, you know, um, can I have 12 people over in my garage with my 90-year-old mother? Mm. Um, is that safe? And um, yeah, while there are probably ways to make it more safe, it might not be exactly the thing that we're suggesting. So let's, uh, let's bring in Phil Griffin now to update us a bit on our plans for distributing a vaccine. Since you last uh, were here on our update, uh, we know that both Pfizer and Moderna now have provided information about uh, early efficacy data mm -hmm. for their vaccines. Um, and that there will be movement towards EUA application, I think, very likely for both of those. Um, how does this impact uh, what we are preparing to do, what your team is working on across the state of Kansas? Mm. Muted. I think maybe we're muted still. Is that working? There we go. Much better. Thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. It's really the announcements this week and last week are really not changing what we're doing because uh, these are things we've been working on and planning uh, since uh, the last several months. And so those those same plans are going forward. We're beginning to get a few more details. When I was here last time, I, I talked about the fact that, you know, we were really struggling at times to be able to respond to some of the questions being asked simply because we didn't have enough information. We're beginning to get a little more information. There's certainly a lot more to be had, but, um, we are continuing to move forward. We've identified some ultra cold storage locations that we'll be able to bring vaccine into the state. Uh, we will continue to be focused in that initial stage where we know uh, once the EUA is approved that we will have uh, some very limited doses available and we'll be prioritizing those. Uh, we are focusing those uh, first ones as being guided by CDC to point those toward uh, healthcare workers that are directly working with uh, COVID patients, uh, particularly in hospital facilities and, and the like. Um, and then quickly be rolling that as we receive more vaccine into addressing um, nursing home long term long term care facilities, multiple other high risk populations. Um, you know the the EUA we're expecting to the application to be dropped from Pfizer uh, with the FDA this week sometime is what they're predicting, and Moderna will follow very quickly beyond that. Uh, we do know there's an expedited process uh, ready to go, and um, they will be acting on those very quickly. There'll be an outside uh, review of that data. Uh, you know, what we have right now is, is information from a press release and information um, that's driven by the companies. And, and certainly we want to make sure that that all those pieces are in place to get a good uh, review and be able to act quickly on that. But we're continuing to be prepared and, and move forward in getting it out as quickly as we can get it in the state. You know, we talk a lot about the fact that vaccines don't save lives, vaccination saves lives, the fact that we have to give the vaccine to our community. Um, and um, there's a lot of logistics that go into managing a vaccination effort of this scale, um, uh, probably something very few of us have actually lived through. Um, you mentioned ultra cold storage, for example, uh, and I believe that's primarily um, um, a complication of the Pfizer vaccine logistics that mm -hmm. Um, maybe the Moderna vaccine can just use freezer storage, for example. Would you explain a bit of the difference and what that means from a logistics perspective? Certainly, from a logistics perspective, we were relieved to see Moderna come out um, in the timeliness that they've come out because the ultra cold storage is going to be more of a challenge. Um, it means that uh, the vaccine will have to be held uh, at 70 plus degrees below zero. 
uh, which a normal freezer obviously will not do. And so we have limited numbers and spaces. There is some special packaging that's coming with that where it can be held uh, in a shipping container uh, for 10 days on a dry ice process with limited access to the vaccine. Uh, so it, it certainly adds multiple layers of, of logistics into it. Uh, we'll be only able to open those containers twice a day um, so as to maintain the, the stability of the vaccine. Uh, but then there, there's some windows after you open it, take out a vial, thaw it, uh, do some reconstitution of the vaccine, and then a, a short window of about five days to be able to get it vaccinated out. So we'll be working uh, for whatever Pfizer vaccine we have. Uh, we will be working uh, for the most part with direct uh, access uh, at the facilities where to be stored at with some hub and spoke type of approach, meaning that we would go in and uh, take those windows when we open the vaccine uh, containers uh, and get some vaccine out and quickly get it dispersed to various areas. Uh, the Moderna vaccine being at standard freezer temperatures is a vaccine uh, type that we're used to. Uh, all of our vaccinators across the state uh, for all types of vaccines are used to storing frozen vaccine in a normal manner and, and being able to work with it. So certainly it will offer us a lot more opportunity, particularly when we're looking at smaller areas uh, of the state, more rural areas of the state where there are fewer doses being given. One of the other challenges with the Pfizer vaccine is that uh, it basically comes in orders of 975 doses. So you have to be able to have a plan in place to be able to vaccinate 975 people uh, in a very short period of time and, and be able to guarantee that. So we don't waste vaccine. And absolutely, we don't want to waste any vaccine through this process because it'll be limited to start with. Sure. You know, one of the things we know about both these vaccine candidates, the Pfizer and the Moderna, is they require two doses, uh, a booster sort of, if you will, um, two or three weeks after your initial injection. Um, I imagine that that also adds complexity to a large scale vaccination program. Um, what are, are your team working on to, to make sure that we've managed those details as best we can? We'll be working with and are already working and will continue to work with all our providers in a reminder recall process so that when someone comes in to get their vaccine um, that they will be told at that time, given some information at that time is about when they need to return. Uh, they'll also will have multiple ways of, of being able to contact and, and remind them. Uh, different providers will use some different methods. Uh, some will be direct phone calls saying, hey, it's time for you to come back in. Others will have some uh, maybe an app on a phone, uh, set a timer on a phone, uh, any kind of way we can come up with. There'll be some cards that may be mailed by some providers, just a variety of ways to do that. One of the keys and important pieces is that uh, let's talk, say we're doing the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. If you get the Pfizer vaccine, it is the Pfizer vaccine booster that you need to come back and get. Uh, if you get the Moderna, it's the Moderna booster that you need to come back and get. So they're not interchangeable vaccines. And that, again, will add another layer of complexity. But we're doing all we can do to make sure that everyone is fully informed when they get their vaccine uh, as to exactly which one it is they need to come back and get and when they need to get it. And they will be proactively uh, reaching out out to assure those people come back. Great. You know, uh, I'll ask you both to address this question in turn. Um, we know, even from a survey of our own healthcare workers, for example, that there are a number of people who are not thrilled about lining up to get a vaccine early in the process. Maybe even 30 or 40 percent say that they wouldn't get a vaccine in the first round. And I'm sure some of the, the concerns there are around safety and efficacy, of course. Um, Knowing that we need as many people as possible vaccinated for this really to have um, a meaningful impact on reducing spread in our communities. Phil, what would you uh, say to convince someone who's on the fence, you know, should they get the vaccine or not? I think the first thing is, is we need to look at the, the data as it comes out. And, and I think part of the problem right now is that we don't have that safety data in front of us for people to look at. Uh, but what I would tell anybody about any vaccine is we're not going to give unsafe vaccines in this country. And it's really important to listen, to look at the data, to, to hear what the science has to say about it. Um, there's a lot of false information that gets put out there. And um, 
you know, making sure that we we understand the sources of, our, of the information that we're getting. And, and most importantly, I, I think is the fact that to have vaccine available and not use it is is only risking our own life. And and we really need to, to be focused on understanding that the way we're going to get things back under control, the way we're going to uh, is putting the whole arsenal of tools put together and vaccines is a big part of that. And, and so I, I just would say, you know, we need to look who the leaders are in our healthcare community and our science community um, and, and, you know, follow those leads, listen to the facts and, um, and understand that they were working in this together and, and certainly there's no intent to harm anyone and, and to understand, you know, the same things we hear about all vaccines is, uh, concerns about an ingredient in the vaccine or, um, you know, the tales of, of various things that happen. But when you really dig down to the root of those, you find that that oftentimes those are not uh, accurate information. And, you know, the, the ingredients oftentimes that are talked about are, are minuscule amounts in there. And quite frankly, there's more of those um, ingredients that are of concern and maybe in, in the things we eat each and every day. And, and so just really understanding and, and trusting the sources. Dr. Norman, same question for you. What would you say to convince the public? Well, as you may have figured out, Phil has been doing this a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has been a, been a con consistent whisperer in my ear. He's the vaccine whisperer. Um, and I, uh, I, I really appreciate that. The other thing I think I would add to it, and we've wrestled with this during this whole pandemic, is that we are really good at epidemiology. We're really good at science but I don't think we've applied what I would call social psychology principles to why is it that people feel this way? Why is it the decisions are the decisions being made? And I think it's really important for those of us, for leaders to lead during this time and to be great listeners because it may not be science or epidemiology that carries the day on whether somebody gets vaccinated or not, but I think it's keeping an open mind and sharing good information. What are you afraid of? Let's talk this through rather than talking down to people or convincing them that science conquers all. Well, if you're a vaccine hesitant individual, it may not be the science that is uh, is going to convince you. I think it's human to human conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such a great point. You know, we've worked fairly extensively uh, in engaging the social scientists on the Lawrence campus. Um, with how we manage the, the student and faculty population there and how we encourage testing and, and manage behavior um, to really to the things that we know work. And I think it's a great question. We'll have to maybe add that to our list of, of ways we bring things to the community. Jill's writing down as I'm saying it. We're thinking exactly the same way. Uh, but I think that's a very, very important point, Lee. Thanks. Um, you know, as I, as I look over your shoulder, Lee, it's, uh, it's a pretty beautiful Kansas day. Um, the, the state house there in the background. Um, thank you for uh, what you have been doing over the past now eight months. It's been uh, no fun some days, I'm sure. Uh, just like we all are tired, I'm sure you are too. Um, and I don't think we can say thank you enough to you and your team. So let's uh, jump, Jill, to some uh, reporter questions. We have five on the line. Go ahead. Wow. Yeah, hi. This is uh, John Shorman over at The Star. I am uh, curious. I have a question about capacity. Uh, generally, what have we learned since the spring about expanding hospital capacity to treat COVID and what advantages and challenges do we face today in expanding capacity that maybe we didn't face in the spring? Sure. I, I may start with that and then um, I'm sure Dr. Norman uh, will have some comments as well. So we, um, like I think most, if not every uh, hospital across the country in the springtime developed a surge plan as we were thinking about what might happen if hundreds or thousands of people needing care for COVID showed up at our doorstep in a couple days time or a week's time. Um, we saw what that looked like actually in practice in New York where patients were cared for in hallways or in parking garages um, or with multiple patients in rooms that were not designed to provide patient care. Um, and while that is definitely better than not having access to care if you need it, we know that outcomes uh, were impacted by different staffing ratios, um, by the lack of availability of the uh, best 
uh, or most appropriate staff or treatments uh, simply because hospitals uh, were overwhelmed. We have learned from that uh, how we could best manage some of those things. I think I've said this before, um, but uh, for our campus here in Kansas City, for example, two of our towers were built and designed in a surge, in a true disaster situation to move from rooms being private rooms, one patient per hospital room, to having everything necessary, all of the wiring and oxygen supply lines and monitors, everything needed to be able to go to semi-private rooms. To in those rooms or those units effectively double our capacity. Um, that's actually what we've what we've learned is that's actually the easy part. Um, as Dr. Norman mentioned, we could build fixed wall or tent facilities, mm -hmm. but the challenge in increasing capacity is we either have to add staff, which likely are not available in large numbers, or we have to change how we staff, which has an impact, probably a negative impact to some degree on outcomes in patient care. And so we work with all of those variables um, and with every available resource, whether it be local or here in our own organization or resources that um, the state um, and the Reserve Medical Corps, for example, would be able to provide to do the best we can. Um, but expanding hospital capacity rapidly in a disaster situation um, is probably never going to be ideal. I don't know. Dr. Norman, things to add there? Briefly, David. John, that's a good question, as always, from you. Uh, the, um, we're, we brought in the Army Corps of Engineers to look at about 10 different facilities that uh, could have been converted and working with our hospital leaders and cl clinical leaders decided not to do that because it, but rather we at the state are following the lead of the hospitals and health systems that say we would rather surge and surge more on our footprint because we have control of that. It's climate controlled. And, and we can bring in gases if we need to. We'd rather surge on our footprint. And we haven't deviated from that yet. I've had sleepless nights on occasion thinking about that, but we're sticking with that for now and then looking at ways to redistribute patients back to their home communities because there's a lot of beds around the state available if we can get them staffed. Great, Jill, next question. Um, this is Celia with the Kansas News Service. I wonder then, um, what role does canceling or scaling back elective, you know, quote unquote elective um, or non-emergency care play in reassigning staff to ICUs or pseudo ICUs to handle more COVID patients? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because we've talked a lot about this and thanks for the distinction around um, elective versus um, uh, deferrable maybe is probably the better word that we're using right now, uh, care. So as an anesthesiologist and someone who really spends a lot of time in the perioperative space, um, I would tell you a couple of things. Number one, that distinction between um, what is non-emergent and what is necessary is really hard. Um, if we talk about delaying things now, we're talking about delaying cancer care. Um, it doesn't feel good to anyone, right? That, that in most cases has a negative consequence for each of those patients. Um, and if we need to do that, of course, if that is truly our only option that's left, we will. Um, and, but the staff that you asked about, um, say the, the nurses from the operating room, many of them have never provided ICU care or have never worked on a floor on the inpatient unit. They've got a specific set of skills that are uh, very unique and very appropriate for the operating room environment during surgery, but are not exactly the same set of skills that are needed in an ideal situation at least to take care of a patient who needs inpatient care. So while we could shift that staff and it would be better than not having staff, um, it still isn't the ideal. And it's the reason why we continue to press so hard on the fact that we need every intervention possible um, to mitigate community spread of COVID to help manage the hospital capacity question. Um, we could, of course, do the same thing if we said we would cancel um, outpatient clinic appointments, the primary care and the ambulatory, the outpatient care for cancer or other things. We could bring those nurses to the bedside in an inpatient unit as well. Um, but the same questions would apply. A different set of skills that are very, very appropriate for the primary work that those healthcare workers do. Um, but maybe not exactly what we would want or need. And so we'll have an impact no matter how we go about it. Next question. 
Good morning. Um, my name is Anna Spurry. I'm a reporter with the Kansas City Star. Um, I was reading a story over the weekend out of St. Louis about um, Barnes Jewish in particular um, and the difficulties they've had managing two crises, the pandemic, and then also just the increase in shooting victims this year. Um, I was wondering if any of the Kansas City area hospitals have, you know, faced a similar toll from that those two crises we're experiencing right now. Well, I may start, and there may be some others that have um, things to add. Um, I think we all know that um, people are stressed. Uh, everyone in the community um, is having to deal with something that they've never had to deal with before. And um, that undoubtedly has led to differences in how we interact with others and likely an increase in, in violence in general. Um, although I've not seen specific numbers to be able to claim percentages. I, I know the St. Louis story you're talking about. I still have family that live in St. Louis. And so I know what, what the, the city of St. Louis has seen in particular. And I'm, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to comment on the, the percentage change here if it's the same. Um, but as far as whether that has impacted um, or, or the COVID situation in the emergency department, for example, has impacted the care that victims of trauma receive. I think um, we can pretty, pretty honestly and candidly say, no, we've not turned away a patient who needed care for trauma um, from um, violence in, in our city. And I would be very, very surprised if any of the other trauma centers uh, in the Metro have found themselves in that situation. Um, it's very possible, I suppose, at some point, if we truly are overwhelmed and you can't fit another patient in an emergency department or an ambulance cannot make it to, um, to a, a shooting victim uh, call, for example, because all of the ambulances are either filled mm -hmm. with other patients or the crews are ill and unable to work, um, that those things could lead to an impact in those situations. But at least to my knowledge, and, and, um, and I think we've, we've checked with our experts, um, the, the impact for those situations I, I don't think exist here in Kansas City. Um, there is maybe a question about transfers. So we've heard a lot about trauma transfers struggling just like other transfers for COVID or any other reason to find an appropriate ICU. Um, and that's really after the stabilizing care happens for that initial injury. Um, and that usually is occurring in an emergency department somewhere um, that makes it safe for that patient because they're stable enough to transport an hour or two or three hours. So um, I, I'm sure at the end of the day when we look at data um, in aggregate for our state or for our area, two years from now when we look back on all this, we will find there are things that we learn about managing trauma patients um, and the impact this has had, but I don't think that we um, have any real significant concern that we're seeing challenges um, for, for those patients at the moment in our emergency departments. I don't know, Dana or Lee, anything to add? I don't have anything, David. Um, that's the same thing I'm hearing and agree with what you said. Another reporter question? Pearson with KCTV. Um, I have a question about immunity. Um, for people who have had COVID, and are just back out business as usual. I have some family members that have had it and they just kind of, you know, go back out and, you know, going to restaurants and everything. How long can they, do we know at this point, can they be comfortable with a certain level of immunity? Mm -hmm. Go for it, Yeah, Dana. you know, I think in general, we are talking about 90 days, um, but that doesn't mean, you know, comfortable with immunity. That doesn't mean that you can get uh, and gather in groups. It doesn't mean that you can't go to uh, indoor areas, whether it's gyms, restaurants, funerals, weddings, parties, without a mask. It doesn't mean that you don't have to social distances, you, distance. You need to continue to do all of those things. In regard to durable immunity, how safe can you feel that you may not get reinfected? probably about 90 days. We know that there have been documented cases as little as uh, between 60 and 70 days. Um, you know, and of course, further out at 120 or 140 days. Uh, but if you have known disease and you've recovered from it, you are probably safe for at least 90 days without having to retest or do anything like that or, or you know, be as concerned about reinfection. But no matter what, even after you've completed your 10 days of isolation, you need to continue to do those uh, uh, public health guidance measures, and that is masking, not meeting in large groups, 
distancing, washing your hands, all of those things that everybody who hasn't been infected are continuing to do. So that is the very important point there. Donna Pittman with Channel mm -hmm. 9 texted a um, question that I think dovetails nicely with this reporter question. She's wanting to know if you would talk about face covering, specifically face shields versus masks. What What is the best mask and covering and how do you wear it? Yeah, um, so first of all, the face shields themselves do not constitute barrier protection. Um, that is in the World Health Organization guidelines and in their statement. So the face shields or uh, Eye protection with goggles are very important, but you still need that mask, you need that barrier protection. Typically, most masks are two to three layers of, of cotton. Those are adequate. Um, I know that a lot of other stores are selling surgical type masks. Those are probably adequate as well. And then, of course, we know a lot of people are wearing N95s. But for the community purposes, you really need that face mask, which is either gonna be the two to three layer cotton mask or the surgical mask or things of that nature. You can, in addition, especially if you're traveling on an, air, on an airplane or something of that nature, wear the face shield and, of course, eye protection um, or eye protection with goggles. Another reporter question? Don, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, did someone else want to ask a question? Go ahead. Otherwise, um, this is Celia again. I, just to go back a second to the idea of like reassigning staff and such. Um, I think at one point you mentioned if um, if you're going to cancel, you know, more quote unquote non-emergency care at this point, that it would be cancer care. So is that because other types of like less urgent care have kind of have all been cleared at this point? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so we have asked our surgical departments to all um, identify two patients for each of their departments every day uh, that um, need procedures that require admission to the hospital afterwards uh, that can be safely delayed um, days to weeks. Uh, so not canceling, not shutting down, but, but looking for ways to help create some capacity because that's about 20 or 30 beds a day and that adds up then over the course of a week. Um, to sort of free up some capacity. Those have been things like kidney stone surgery, where um, you now have a patient who's in pain and at a slightly higher risk of infection. They need a stent to prevent infection, and it doesn't have to happen today, but if it doesn't happen next week, we've maybe got an issue. So those are examples, or that's a very specific example of, yes, the type of um, non-cancer but still need to be done procedures that we're already pushing back just a little bit to make room. Um, and so it's important because if you think then, well, what about all these other things that we think about um, as elective uh, maybe or non-emergent? So total joints, for example, very few total joints get admitted to the hospital. Um, they're an outpatient surgery now. A lot of back surgery or sports medicine surgery, rotator cuffs, for example, or knee scopes um, or gallbladders even. A lot of surgery now we've gotten so good at doing surgery on an outpatient basis that those things don't take up inpatient beds, hernia repairs, we could go on down the list. So those things are not impacting hospital capacity at all. Uh, and so we've already begun delaying things like back surgeries that need to stay in the hospital or the kidney stone examples, um, or sometimes hysterectomies if someone needs it maybe for bleeding but not bleeding that's related to cancer. Uh, so yes, I think, I think what we're saying is we've already taken steps to manage those things that are not cancer related that might have an impact on capacity. And we would really be going to the things that would have a much greater impact on patients and their outcomes if we had to delay any more. Any other reported questions on the line? I'll get the last one then to Donna Pittman again with Channel 9. She's wanting to know what you think, and she's interested in Dr. Norman's opinion as well, on the new rules that KCMO is implementing regarding COVID that go into effect on Friday. Is it gonna make a difference? Well, I'll, I'll start and then Lee, <laughs> you can maybe save me. Um, I think uh, as we said yesterday, right? Um, anything that we do to outline mitigation strategies to prevent community spread will be helpful. Um, there's nothing that is um, not going to be helpful, but 
We're also not going to be able to set rules for every set of circumstances, and our public health officials and, and elected officials, um, uh, I think, are, are continuing to support the notion that the things that we know work, right, the pillars of infection prevention and control, wearing your mask, keeping your bubble small, physically distancing, good hand hygiene, getting tested as well when you have any symptoms early and often, that those things help manage spread in the community. Um, and we're not gonna have rules that force all of those things in every set of circumstances. So it's really incumbent upon each of us uh, to, to do things, right, to change our behavior to mitigate that spread. And the rules as they were outlined um, from a public policy perspective, our elected leaders and public health of, uh, officers feel like they help address some of the areas where we're seeing the most spread um, in our community. And so I think it definitely will have benefit um, will it be enough? Time will tell. Um, can we all do more? Absolutely. Uh, Lee, anything to add? Um, pretty, pretty much agree totally, David. The, what I will say is that more restrictive works better than less restrictive. Um, goes without saying. There's even good evidence um, about that. But what it, it's also a balancing act. How much do we want to restrict schools or not? How much do we want to impact businesses or not? So it's a balancing act uh, of hitting something in the middle there that works uh, while keeping society, and I hate to say limping along, but, but moving along well enough. Uh, but without question, more restrictive works better than less restrictive. I agree with David 100%, which is we want to have people understand the principles and not try to skirt the rules, because if they're skirting the rules, they're really skirting the principles. Absolutely. Okay, last call for reporter questions, and then we can rock through maybe three or four community mm, questions. Okay. All right, so Emily wants to know, do we know if these vaccines will be one time like polio or measles or if they're gonna be annual like the flu? Dana? Well, I anticipate they're probably gonna be at least annual. Um, maybe semi-annual, we don't know. We know that with regular cough and cold coronaviruses that have been circulating for many, many years, you can get reinfected, um, you know, maybe as early as six months, but nine months, 12 months, 15 months after the original infection. So. We anticipate at least, probably yearly, um, hopefully not less than that. But also remember, these are probably just the first generation of vaccines in which we'll probably have two or three generations. So I think it's too early to tell right now, but I, I believe we do anticipate that at least um, once yearly, probably. Brecken, and I hope I'm saying that right because I love the spelling, is in college, wants to go home over Thanksgiving, is concerned about making sure that they're proactive and not being a carrier. They say their classes have been mostly online. They want advice from the doctor on what should Brecken do to be as safe as possible when visiting family. So this question actually came up from um, the University of Kansas, the Lawrence campus community yesterday in a uh, town hall in a video recording um, with the chancellor. And so I'll, I'll maybe throw out the things that I suggested and I'm sure um, our, all of our guests uh, have probably some, some things to add. One of the things I think that's important is if you're really worried about doing what's absolutely safest, then quarantine upon return to your home, your family. Um, when you return to, to that place, spend 14 days quarantined um, so that you know that you don't have symptoms and you are not infectious to others. Um, of course, that's not always easy to do um, and there's gonna be a holiday in there. And so if you are unable to strictly quarantine, then all of these things that we talk about around the pillars of infection prevention and control, mask wearing, keeping your distance even from your family, um, you know, not eating uh, together, if at all possible to avoid close contact with masks off, those sorts of things would remain important. And Dana, things you wanna add? No, I think that, that was well said. Yeah, all absolutely. right, two questions for Dr. Norman. Betsy wants to know, she just heard from that Topeka News said that Stormont Vale is full and it's at its limit for COVID patients. She says, now what? And her question is, why can't the hospitals have a say whether there is a stay at home order? Well, the hospitals do have a say, uh, sorry, the hospitals do have a say in this matter, but the ones who ultimately prevail are county commissioners and we can have all the opinions in the world and we're seeing health officers around the state resigning because they get crosswise with their county commissioners and local leaders. Um, but she's absolutely right. Storm on Vale hit the peak number yesterday. Uh, I believe they have 81 inpatients with COVID-19. And I would suggest that she uh, and other leaders 
uh, talk with the county commissioners about that because they're the ones that have the ultimate say in this. And the next question is from Sean, who wants to know, how long will it take to get enough monoclonal antibodies for the state of Kansas to make a difference in hospitalizations? We just got our first dose, right? Yeah, we did. Yeah, about 60, I think, or so doses. But Lee, uh, or, or Phil, maybe across the state, do you have thoughts? We don't know exactly the delivery schedule. I think we've had 1,300 doses delivered to the state of Kansas, and we've distributed those out. Um, the pipeline is a little uncertain. I'll ask Phil to comment yeah. to see if you know anything more about that than I do, Phil. No, I, I think that's pretty much where we're at right now. It's it's an allocation process, and we have a algorithm worked out uh, through emergency management that is dispersing those uh, based on where the patients are right now, and uh, we'll get it out as quickly as we can. And Phil, any um, comment on the issue of that, the question of the vaccines, if I was misinformed about boosters and yearly? And No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we don't know right now. And as more vaccines are being developed, uh, you know, we've got two that are, are about to hit the pipeline right now, and um, but there are still others that are in development. And uh, as those continue to, to roll out and then and, and new generation information is made on them, I, you know, it's, I would say probably at least yearly right now. And as far as, you know, how much will impact hospitalizations, that's really difficult to say as it is a small amount of allocation as Lee had just talked about, you know, for whichever community you are in, it's a small amount. So there's also the um, processes of really screening out who is okay to get it who is, meets criteria for that, and then, of course, getting it itself. It's not just as easy as, say, writing a prescription for um, Tamiflu and going down to the pharmacy and picking up. It's a, it's a process that takes probably about three hours when it's all said and done to go and get it and be monitored and all of that kind of stuff. So um, there are some caveats with being able to um, distribute and dispense it as well. And Julie has a follow-up question to that. She says, what should I do? Should my 70-year-old um, mother contact her physician right now and say, how do I get my vaccine? <laughs> what is the process going to be? So, Phil, you're probably the, the best able to answer the process questions. Yeah, the, the process is going to be as, as we have the vaccine available, it will be, uh, we'll do a lot of mass communication. We're working on communication plans now. Uh, there are three phases of the vaccine, and actually the first phase is, is divided into two parts. Uh, phase 1A is, is what we've talked about most right now, which is, is getting to those uh, high-risk healthcare workers that are directly caring for uh, COVID-positive patients. Uh, 1B is, is moving into long-term care and uh, assisted living and things of that nature uh, and other high-risk groups. And then rolling kind of over into phase two is, is really focused with essential workers and, uh, and others that are at high risk of infection. And then phase three will be general public. I think what's important for everybody to understand is that the mass availability of vaccine is likely not gonna be until the second and third quarter of next year um, before we're really able to see those, those huge numbers of vaccine that will really meet market demand. But um, it, you know, it'll be scaling up uh, rapidly and uh, pri being prioritized. And, and we actually today starts a meeting of an external group that is advising us um, on making sure that all the efficacy issues are being looked at. Uh, we know that there are different populations that are hit uh, more drastically with this virus, and, and we want to make sure that and as we're allocating those vaccines out, as we're getting them widespread, that we're able to, to meet the greatest demands first and uh, for those that are at greatest risk. So today, I would say no, don't call your provider and ask for it, but certainly not available. Um, but there will be lots of communication going out in a variety of ways. I think it is really important for everyone to understand, Phil, that that timeline likely means it's next spring before widespread immunization of the general public um, is even really a viable option. Um, and that means that we're in for a winter of much more of the same that we've been talking about, right? Pillars of infection prevention and control, mitigating community spread, keeping you and those that you care about safe. Last question goes to Rebecca. She wants to know if someone needs care, how do they know 
which hospitals are taking patients? So I guess my most general answer, Rebecca, would be um, that uh, hospitals are not turning away patients that show up needing care. Uh, we find a way. Uh, doesn't mean it's easy, doesn't mean it's ideal, but if you need care, go to the closest place that's able to provide that care for you. And if something is needed um, that is a, a capability that that particular facility does not have, they will find a way to get you to some place um, that, that can. So we see that question a lot with ICU care. Should, uh, should I go to my local hospital even if they don't have all of the right ICU care? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's the ability to stabilize mm -hmm. anyone who needs urgent or emergent care at every hospital facility across uh, our region. And um, that then care after stabilization would, would be managed um, with an appropriate transfer. And I know we've talked about that being challenging, um, but um, we are working really, really hard, at least at this point, to make sure that that's available to everyone. So please do just go to the place that is closest and most able to get emergency care for you, and, and they will help um, really, our entire medical community will help get you the care that you need to the best of our ability. All right. Well, it may be hard to believe, but we are in week 35 now of these morning media updates, and we will be back tomorrow to check in on Anil Gallmacher. Okay. You may recall Anil caught COVID-19 back in April, was in our hospital for some time, was on a <laughs> ventilator, um, and has actually been in and out of the hospital since. He was back with our team yesterday for a procedure related to uh, his time on his ventilator. Um, so in addition to Anil, who will join us tomorrow, we've invited his doctor, Dr. Shannon Kraft, one of our head and neck surgeons, to talk more about what it's like to be on a ventilator from a medical point of view and what complications and um, uh, details you can expect after that, things that you definitely won't want to miss. Also tomorrow, if you at all can, consider giving blood at the Church of the Resurrection Blood Drive happening now through Thursday. The need in our community is great, and the church is staying open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, for this blood drive. You can make an appointment at savealifenow.org. Um, and with that, uh, let's move on to final thoughts. Uh, Phil, things you'd like to share with the community as we wrap up today? I just uh, appreciate everybody's efforts to to continue to be more focused in and really pay attention. We're heading into a very dark time, um, unfortunately, with um, decisions that are having to be made. And, and I, I think it's important for people just to, to stay the course and recognize that we're all in this together. Um, be cautious and be aware and, and just follow the pillars. And, and if we can all get on board with that, we can turn this thing around. So keep going. Thanks, Dr. Norman. Get your flu shot. One of the best ways to unencumber our health care system for something that is preventable is by getting your influenza vaccine. So if you haven't gotten it, get it now. Uh, we talk a lot about COVID-19. We can't let influenza uh, be anything other than top of mind. Get your flu shot. Excellent point. Dana. Uh, no, I just echo what, what Phil and Lee said, and I just appreciate um, their insights and their knowledge today on the show. Um, it probably made me sound a lot smarter than I have since the update began because I didn't have to talk too much. Uh, but they were certainly a wealth of knowledge and, and insight, and I appreciate them being on. As do I. Uh, so I guess I would, would wrap up um, just with that same reminder that um, we all have a part to play in this. And while we have continually shared the message of remain vigilant and do your best not to become weary, um, we are truly at the point where individual behaviors matter um, and probably matter more than they have at any point in the pandemic. So for all of the topics that we've talked about, whether it be the pillars, infection, prevention and control, Dr. Norman's a reminder that influenza vaccination remains a key part of managing our ability to take care of those who need health care in our community. Um, and Dana's point that um, we have a significant number of resources available, and our two guests this morning um, are absolute proof of that. Um, help us. Help us. We're in this together. Um, you know the things that make a difference. As we close, we'll give the final words to Dr. Stites, who yesterday remarked that the Midwest is on fire with COVID-19. 
He continues those thoughts with a look at the consequences for all of us if we fail to get the virus under control. Be safe. Take the pillars of infection prevention and control with you wherever you go. And we'll be back with you tomorrow. The entire Midwest is on fire. And as a result, we're struggling to get patients placed. When you get overwhelmed with health care resources, it's not just the COVID patients who suffer. It's if you have a heart attack or a stroke, where are you going to go? So I'm over to the hospital. Well, not the hospital's overwhelmed. Where are you going to go? That's the choice you face. If you're in a car accident and you have big trauma and you need to go to the hospital, where are you going to go? Well, if the hospital's overwhelmed with COVID positive patients, where are you going to go? I mean, that's the choice you face. It's not just the COVID patients. It's all of our patients. It's all the people we have to care for. So when people say, I can do anything I want, I'm like, no, you can't. That's ridiculous. The Constitution starts with we the people. It doesn't start with either one. It starts with we the people.